In this video, we're going to briefly talk about uh, Bayesian optimization. Now, Bayesian optimization is one of those ideas that have made huge changes in the land of machine learning. In fact, uh, the ideas that I'm showing you uh, was first sh was first published in around 2010 uh, at the ICML, International Conference of Machine Learning, and it has won the paper of the decade uh, now in 2020. The purpose of the video is really to give you an idea of how we can do auto ML. It's not necessarily to show you state of the art auto ML. There are other approaches which I'll touch on. Um, but it's really just to give you the intuition so that when you see certain things in different packages, you sort of know uh, or have a better idea of what they mean. So let's jump right in. To do this, I'm going to firstly talk about Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes um, is a way of how uh, this approach allows us to um, choose some kind of sequential optimization. This is opposed to other approaches like random optimization where um, you just choose points randomly uh, and which is in the space of things like um, simulated annealing and genetic algorithms um, whereby you may have populations of points that you slowly uh, improve but it, it doesn't have the same kind of uh, theoretical guarantees that you might have in sequential model-based optimization like in Bayesian optimization. At the high level, the, I, the, the idea is that we want to um, fit our fitness function or our loss function or what, or what have you, the target function that you have um, to a surrogate uh, model, which is in this case modeled by the Gaussian process. Where it works well is when the modeling of the Gaussian process is substantially cheaper than the actual target function that you want to model. So for example, if you're building a model and you have a very large data set, um, perhaps training that model many, many times is quite expensive. Whereas if you have already evaluated a set number of points and you just want to fit a Gaussian process over the top, that, that would be cheaper than building that model. There are instances where fitting a Gaussian process is more expensive than actually evaluating the functions, and in, in that case, other approaches might be better. Um, this is indeed something that you just have to play around with and understand, and it's not really something that um, you can really assess at a theoretical level to say that, oh, in this particular case, it's better to use random optimization, and in another particular case, it's better to use Bayesian optimization. Instead, it's really something that you um, gain a better intuition of and um, through experience and just trial and error. All right, so let's consider um, this example here. So let's say that we are we, this is the ground truth function that we have, but we don't actually um, we don't actually know what this function looks like when we want to find the minimum point in this particular case. Instead, we only have a set number of points um, that we have as a starting point. So let's say that in this case, I've picked um, I've taken five points, and then I want to um, determine what is the next point I should pick in terms of evaluating in this sequential model-based optimization problem. So um, the approach that we would take using a Gaussian process is you just fit a Gaussian process through these five points, right? And then um, let's just, for example, do this. So I've generated five random points. I've fit a Gaussian process through these points and the line in red is an indi indication of what a proposed, um, the, the curve may look like. So um, what you can do with Gaussian processes is you can get a, some um, notional idea of the mean and standard deviation um, for all of these curves, and then you end up with something that looks like this. All right, and, and in, indeed already in this particular case, there's already some ideas that may form. For example, um, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, it's much more noisy. So um, there's an idea that maybe you might want to explore and understand that area more because it has the potential to be um, to be very, very good in terms of there's a minimum point in this region, or it could be absolutely horrible. We don't we don't know enough. 
um, whereas in this region over here um, the standard deviation is much smaller so then um, it, it suggests that maybe uh, if we want to be more conservative we actually maybe just want to pick a point here because there's more I suppose guarantee that there may be a point that is superior to the five that we've shown. Now this raises an interesting question in terms of Gaussian processes and the, some of the assumptions in this sequential model based optimization. One of them is that um, there is an assumption that the fitness function is somewhat smooth. If it isn't smooth and it, you know that there's a lot of discontinu discontinualities in terms of the fitness curve, then this approach wouldn't work either, right? Because you know, we have no guarantee that picking one point um, is, uh, in, is indicative that the next point that is close to it um, has a similar kind of performance. So that's another assumption in here that we have to um, we have to use. So if the fitness curve or the particular function that you're evaluating is not considered smooth, then this approach probably wouldn't work. Now, um, sort of as I've said before, we can we can say that oh the region on the left is more noisy and hence there's uh, more potential for improvement and the region here on the right hand side um, is less noisy and maybe we have some kind of idea that it may improve um, if we just search a little bit but it w wouldn't stray too far off and then already we we are talking about the difference between uh, exploitation and exploration so one side is more noisy, the other side is not. So you have an exploitation and exploration kind of dilemma. So how can we pick the next point to evaluate based on this idea? So one way how we can do it is using the idea of confidence bounds. And we can control this by saying um, how many standard deviations are we comfortable with picking something, right? So for example, if we um, want something that has less variance, then the answer is that we approach the, the actual mean. So the expected value of this Gaussian process uh, as our next point. So if the expected value of a particular point is lower than our um, current best point, then maybe we can pick that point because we expect it to be superior than um, our, our previous evaluations. But maybe we want to have um, some idea of what the um, standard deviation is. And if we increase that amount because we allow more surprise, if you like, um, then, then we are interested in the mean plus some uh, exploration ex exploitation parameter times the standard deviation so that's that's the that's the thing that we can do here so for example a confidence bound could look something like this in this particular case which means that if we um, in this case I've picked the uh, the um, confidence bound to be one standard deviation. So if one standard deviation away, the next point that we want to evaluate, if it's the lowest, is probably a point down here because this is the area that we think is the best point, the best next point, right? Um, which I've, I've shown in blue here. So blue would be the next point that we will pick according to the confidence bound, whereas black is like um, where our um, mean for our... Um, where the mean for our Gaussian process is. So if we picked um, a, a the kappa, which is the parameter that controls this, so we'd pick kappa to be zero, then it would be the black point. Okay. Now, on the other hand, we can use expected improvement. So expected improvement instead uh, is a closed form solution specifically for Gaussian process to say that, okay, um, if we know what is our best point, what is the expected improvement if we pick another point? And um, we have here the, the line in black to show what is expected improvement from picking different points. Now, what, what is interesting here is um, the, the, the fact that if we compare the, the two black lines in the two plots is that on the bottom one, um, there is a strong bias to the region that we haven't seen before. Whereas you can see here, it's almost saying that the, the region between um, where my arrow is here, between here and here, is in fact there's no point evaluating those two points because we, we know that this point that is close to 2 is definitely higher than this point that is close to, uh, let's say, 0 0.75. And therefore, this whole region between 0 0.75 and 2, well, there's no point evaluating that because it, it, it's probably worse off. 
So this is what expected improvement is. It's a closed form solution. And uh, in this particular case, it does say that we should evaluate some of the more unseen areas. The advantage of expected improvement, which is I think the default in um, a lot of the libraries that we use, including scikit-optimize, is that you don't actually have to specify a exploration exploitation kind of parameter to penalize the difference there. So that's something to think about there as well. All right. Now, based on all this, how can we um, how can we use a library like Scikit Optimize to have a look at these these things? Um, and I thought that I'll show you some of the nice plots that they generate in terms of how this can work. So, for example, um, if I scroll down, uh, we can have a look at hopefully. Oops, no, I need to run all. Uh, if we look at the very last plot, it will show you how um, sequentially it will learn and train according to what it has currently seen to pick the next best point. Um, and this becomes really, really important in terms of understanding how this process works. So for example, in the first plot, um, where, it, where we have in green the uh, current line that is proposed, um, yeah, and we can see the confidence bounce, and and we can see how this particular pl plot changes over time. So just focus on the area that is in green. So we can see over time, um, the, the, the regions that it chooses changes right, um, over the sequential points. So hopefully, let me double check that my plots are working. Cause, yep, I'm going to pick a different seed just to demonstrate that this actually works because I think the random seed luckily was very lucky and in fact um, managed to find something that wasn't too bad. But let's try a different seed and hopefully uh, we will see a different result. So as we can see in the green line here, initially this starts off as flat, probably because all our points just so happen to be in areas that um, were pretty flat. But as we evaluate it, we can see that the green um, regions just slowly, slowly morph into the, the red curve that we would like to see. And we can see uh, on, also on the right hand side, these are the expected improvement plots. So we can um, understand what are the next points that they try to pick and the best points that it currently sees as well. So um, we can see that initially it, it has a bias towards this uh, local minimum here, right? And then um, as it goes and explores and determines what's the next point, all of a sudden it goes towards this point down here, which is um, close to the global minimum that we can see because we, 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 we essentially have an oracle function that is in red. So this is just a quick introduction to Bayesian optimization, some of the ideas behind it, and also a very quick usage of the scikit optimize. Uh, maybe in a future video, I'll talk about how we can um, do some kind of conditional uh, sequential optimization, which is used for um, more more common uh, more more commonly used hyperparameter optimization libraries such as hyperopt. Thanks for watching.